It doesn't matter how much snow falls. When we set a snowstorm, we really mean it. How strong the wind blows. Look at the wind, take that one. Or how hard the rain comes down. I've never seen so much rain in my life. NFL football always forges ahead. It's NFL Explained Worst Weather Games. No matter how bad the weather might get, nothing stops an NFL game from finishing. Only weather that matters is whether they want it more than us. Well, except for that one preseason game between the Pittsburgh Steelers and the college All-Stars. Henry on his very first play, firing out to Tommy Riemann and a flash of lightning, and believe me, it is coming down. This is one of the most insane rain games you'll ever see. The storm that hit that game in the third quarter, straight out of a disaster movie. I don't think I've ever seen it rain this hard at a football game, Frank. <laughs> I don't believe I've ever seen it rain this hard. It's crazy enough to think about an NFL team playing against college players, but it used to be a tradition. A tradition that came to an end under what might be the wettest game in NFL history. I don't know whether I'm going to stay under an umbrella because you, unless you've got a plastic shaft on it, uh, you might be in deep trouble. <laughs> Fans at the game used the terrible conditions to storm the field mid-game. So between college kids running all over the place, lightning, and a ridiculous amount of rainfall, they called the game off in the third quarter. It was the last time an NFL team would play against college players. I have no idea what we're going to do. The Steelers have seen their fair share of wet games that counted, too. One of the most memorable, their muddy night football game in 2007 against the Dolphins. One and a half inches of rain came down just before kickoff, the game also earning the nickname of Monday Night Mud. Punts at times, sticking into the turf the way a golf ball does when it lands on a soggy green. Players had zero traction. It's like the game was moving in slow motion. No shock, neither team was able to score a single point until Pittsburgh, with 17 seconds left in the fourth quarter, hit the game-winning field goal from 24 yards out. The snap, the ball is down, that kick is on its way. That kick is good! The first score of the football game belongs to the Pittsburgh Steelers with 17 seconds left. Those two teams also hooked up for another classic mud fest in 1989 in Miami. But in that game, the slop didn't slow down the offense at least. A first half downpour produced two inches of rain, creating ankle deep mini lakes all over the field. Merrill Hodge relishing the chance to feel like a kid again. It was extremely fun because you used to get in trouble for doing that when you were little, you know, your mother used to always get mad at you and now you're, you're getting paid to do that. It doesn't happen all the time, so you know when it does happen, it's almost like you know we're making history right now, so let's have fun doing it. There wasn't much on the line for the Dolphins in that game, though, not compared to their other famous mud game that took place seven years earlier. Nineteen eighty-two AFC Championship game, Jets Dolphins, known forever on as the Mud Bowl. The Dolphins won the game 14-0, Miami's A.J. Dewey, the one guy who seemed to relish the muck, coming up with three interceptions of Richard Todd. It's intercepted at the line of scrimmage. It's going to be run in for a touchdown by A.J. Dewey at the 10 to 5. He scores! New York players and coaches were skeptical after the game, though. They were the much faster team, so the soaking wet field was a disadvantage to them. New York's head coach, Walt Michaels, telling reporters afterwards, there were some things that went on. The league rules to cover the field, and it wasn't. What else needs to be said? The first game to earn the Mud Bowl moniker was played in 1964, a torrential downpour soaking Bush Stadium. The New York offensive unit gets its muddy baptism with Y.A. Tittle passing to Aaron Thomas, who loses his footing but hangs on to the slippery ball for a touchdown. Forget being able to tell who was who or what the markings on the field looked like. It was like watching guys play football in a giant pig pen. The muddy melee continues into the fourth quarter as the Giants drive goalward through the slot. One reporter describes the field as too thick to drink and too thin to plow. The game ended in a 10-10 tie, which cost the Cardinals a division title by a half a game. Mud has made a mess of things in plenty of games over the years. Let's check out a few of the bigger slop fests the NFL has ever seen. We used to play out of the school all the time. The more mud, the better. It really wasn't about scoring or really winning even. It was just about getting dirty. And that's probably the best way to have it. 
It's just go down and get dirty, get make your mom mad. That's the biggest thing. Sayers, NFL Rookie of the Year. A one-man gale, dashing 85 dazzling yards on the longest punt return of the season. Here he is, galloping gale, carrying the mail. This is his sixth touchdown of the game. One NFL legend put it as no one else could. Take it away, John. It used to be when you would ask a kid, you know, what happens when you mix dirt and water? The answer is mud. Now you ask a kid what happens when you mix dirt and water, and they say erosion. I mean, I don't know why you can't get good mud anymore. They got stuff they call prescription turf now. They're mixing grass and plastic, and you know, they're messing with things too much. It's like tomatoes. You, know, you never get a good tomato anymore. You never get a tomato that tastes like tomato. The Mud Bowl nickname also got slapped on a 1998 game between the Seahawks and Chiefs, but it was more like the Flood Bowl than the Mud Bowl. The storm aimed to outdo El Nino, showering both teams in its fury. Kansas City was in the midst of one of its worst floods on record. On game day, there was actually a tornado watch. The game itself was delayed in the second quarter by thunderstorms. And the referee's on the phone. That's the crew chief, Phil Luckett, as the lightning now more intense than it's ever been. KC won it in the end by a score of 17 to 6 in a game that included nine turnovers and up to five inches of rain on some parts of the field. Can't talk Chiefs and rainy games, though, without bringing up the Monsoon Bowl. The mayor called for them to open a floodgate, and that allowed us to play the game. 1979, Kansas City was in Tampa Bay for a game dominated by Mother Nature, who helped hold both teams off the scoreboard for most of the game. On their most promising offensive play of the game, Jerry Eckwood, rookie running back, broke loose and was on his way to what looked like a 70-yard touchdown run. The ball just kind of squirted loose like a greased pig. The whipping rains basically made passing an afterthought. Kansas City was held to just 80 total yards for the game. The Buccaneers actually had something to play for, too, as a division title was on the line for them. 19-yard field goal attempt. Neil O'Donoghue awaiting the snap from Steve Wilson. It is a low snap. The kick is up. Good! The Buccaneers are the NFC Central Division champions. There have been uh, probably no more celebration in NFL history over a 19-yard field goal than this one. I'll tell you what, it was pandemonium in that stadium. I saw guys wallowing in the water, kissing the ground. <laughs> What's it say? What's it say? <laughs> From the Monsoon Bowl to the Tsunami Bowl we go. 2011, the Jaguars were in Carolina, and it didn't look so bad at kickoff, but then midway through the second quarter, it hit. Watching players try and keep their balance in the game was like watching Bambi run across a frozen pond. Guys had zero balance and were hydroplaning all over the place with little to no ability to stop themselves. I mean, he slid seven yards after he hit the ground. Four inches of rain fell on the field in less than an hour. Water was everywhere, fans having to bail out of their seats as small waterfalls poured down on them. He's going to be shoveling water for a while, I think, to get that boat empty. From Cam Newton's first season in Carolina to his first in New England. Fast forward to 2020, the Patriots hosting the favored Ravens. It is miserable in New England, and the rain continues to blow sideways at Gillette Stadium. But luck favors the prepared, and the Pats had practiced for the rain all season, and it showed. Slippery snaps and bobbled balls kept the Ravens from taking control of the game, giving New England the upset win. Holy cow. Look again, that horrible snap, and this time a big loss on the play. And just in case you don't think it ever rains in LA, we offer up this beauty of a game from 1977. The Vikings were in town for a divisional playoff game against the Rams. A funny thing happened on the way to the Los Angeles Coliseum, however. A two-year drought ended. A two-year drought that maybe the Rams wish had lasted a little bit longer. 
the legendary John Facenda summed it up perfectly. Aqueous slime had the players moving like ponderous leviathans, sliding and slogging in primeval ooze. The cleverly camouflaged Vikings, who would be at home playing in quicksand, squirted to a 14 to nothing lead. Then, as one of those gloomy Scottish poets might say, in the misty gloaming, the Rams closed with a gallant rush. But alas, they fell full seven short to retreat in defeat from a field of mush. LA was favored, but the Vikings were more used to playing in adverse elements. Big one off skin a minute. They were able to pick off Pat Hayden three times, once in the end zone and all three in the red zone en route to a 14-7 win. Now, before we dry off and hit the powder, let's take a quick look at a few other wet and wild games from the past. You make it rain, he make it rain, I make a hurricane. You make it rain, I make a hurricane. You make it rain, I make a hurricane. You make it rain, I make a hurricane. I make a hurricane. Okay, time for some snow angels now. And how do you not start with a game that earned the nickname the Blizzard Bowl? The weather outside grew frightful. The snow continues to come down and it has intensified. The weather forecast for that 2013 game between the Lions and Eagles, a mere dusting. That or, you know, eight inches of snow. I think that's Chip Kelly, but to be frank, I have no idea. Jim Schwartz, maybe, <laughs> maybe just an usher. The Lions, seven fumbles. Neither team even bothered with a field goal attempt and only one extra point attempt. It's blocked. You got to battle for every inch out here. Nice. Any play can turn it, right? Yeah. It is second down and 10. Oh, gives it off to McCoy. He's got running room, steps over a man. The Sean McCoy plowed through the snow and the Lions for 217 yards, breaking Steve Van Buren's single-game team rushing record. A record, coincidentally, set in another snow game back in 1948. And this wasn't just any game, it was the title game. Here we are out at Chide Park, and we weren't kidding when we said that it was really snowing. It's almost game time, and off comes the huge tarpaulin. Even the players lend a hand. You heard it right, the Philly blizzard at Scheib Park dumped so much snow, the tarp ended up being too heavy for the groundskeepers to move it off the field by themselves. The game itself, the first NFL championship game ever broadcast on television. On the three yard line, Jerry Davis takes it and reels off 25 yards before Russ Kraft drops him. Now, fans didn't get to see a lot of scoring. The game was scoreless into the fourth quarter before Steve Van Buren finally ran it in for Philly's first title. And the Philadelphia Eagles become the 1948 world champions by a score of seven to nothing. The Raiders and Patriots weren't playing for a title in 2001, but they were playing for a shot at one. Welcome to the winter wonderland that is Foxborough Stadium. Tonight, the Patriots against the Oakland Raiders in the AFC semifinals, and the snow is coming down in Foxborough and will come down throughout this evening. It was an AFC divisional playoff game, and it was a snow football lover's dream. Can you get this one? I promise. I promise that. That game went down as one of the most famous games of all time, too. Adam Vinatieri somehow able to hit a 45-yard field goal to send it to overtime. It is good! 45 yards! Vinatieri's field goal in OT, of course, sent the Pats to an AFC championship game and then to the Super Bowl, sparking a two-decade-long dynasty. What a gritty football team, I tell you what. The Packers have played their fair share of flurry football, but their divisional matchup with the Seahawks in 2007, known as the Snow Globe game, didn't begin that way. Things could not have started any worse. Playoff jitters. It's done. It's done. It's done. We're going to need you today. And then, almost like it was scripted, the weather shifted, and with it, the game. A winter storm transformed Lambeau Field into a magical place where all the Packers' dreams came true. 
It's like a snow globe here. It's a winter wonderland. Very hard to see the yard lines. Seattle might be used to playing in the rain, but Brett Favre and the pack were connoisseurs of the cold. They ripped off six straight TDs to win it 42 to 20. But even the frozen tundra faithful couldn't handle what Mama Nature dumped on them in 1985. Over a foot of snow blanketed Lambo. Far from sunny Tampa, the Bucks were indeed out of their element. Green Bay's game against the Buccaneers is known simply as the Snow Bowl. I have to wonder how many different games have been called that. But this one earned it. There were 36,000 no-shows, the most missing cheeseheads for a game in the franchise's history. Going to be second down and about five yards to go. Here is the handoff. Coming to the left is Gary Ellis. Ellis looking for a first down, and he's got it. He's on his feet, he's going to go. Down the left sidelines. Gary Ellis, touchdown, Green Bay. Steve Young was the Bucks' QB, but he threw for just 53 yards. Hard to connect on passes when your receivers are wearing all white in the middle of a snowstorm. The Packers smothered Tampa Bay 21 to nothing. Oh, and uh, we didn't really forget the nickname that 2001 Pats Raiders game earned, the Tuck Rule game. We just wanted to see how many people would blow up the comments section prematurely. Woodson showing blitz. Here he is bearing down on Brady, oh, calls the football. Beaker dives on the ball. The Raiders have the ball. And I ran off the field and I was so pissed. I couldn't believe that you know I'd fumbled the ball to lose the game. After reviewing the play, the quarterback's arm was going forward. It is an incomplete. All right, Patriots retain the ball. We also didn't forget the infamous snowplow game New England was involved with in 1982. In snow-covered Schaefer Stadium, the snow, wind, and freezing temperatures made footing treacherous. The snowplow game, you know, that brings back a lot of bad memories. <laughs> as much snow as there was for that game, it was even worse than it looked. The night before, there was a ton of rain. With both teams slipping and sliding all day, Miami's best chance to score was thwarted by the frozen turf. The two teams couldn't muster any points until the fourth quarter when the Patriots finally got into field goal range. Our quarterback, Steve Grogan, comes running up to me and said, Coach, Coach, why don't you go down and get that snow brush, cut a swath for the kicker to uh, kick the ball, clear it out. A great idea. So I run down to about the 10-yard line, and I grab this Mark Henderson, who incidentally is on work release from Walpole Prison. Thanks to the strangest power sweep in New England's history, John Smith put the Patriots ahead. Smith comes to the ball. There is the boot. It's flying downfield, and it's good. Patriots lead. John Smith puts it through. The snowplow operator, by the way, given the game ball by Pat's coach Ron Meyer afterwards. Miami would get its revenge when they beat the Patriots in the first round of the playoffs that same year. An unlikely snow drift in the corner of Miami's Orange Bowl served as a pointed parody. But come on now, dolphins swimming in the snow, Thanksgiving dinner, and one of the most bizarre endings to a game anyone has ever seen, it's none other than the Sleet Bowl, or as some like to call it, the Leon Lett game. As bad as all the snow was, it was all the sleet that fell during the game that made the players look like first-time ice skaters at a local ice skating rink. But this game is famous for how it ended, because if you were watching it live, it was one you'll never forget. It was supposed to be a routine field goal. Instead, it became the wildest sequence of the entire season. Stojanovic will decide it. Doug Peterson to hold. the ball and then the Dolphins went on and recovered it. It's on the one yard line and there's three seconds left on the clock. Now someone touches the football here. Watch what happens. It's Leon Lett. No. Oh, Leon Lett. Leon Lett. The kicking team gets awarded the ball at the spot in the field of play. First down. Oh, boy. Well, you heard it. <laughs> three seconds on the clock. And they're still trying to clear off a space down there for Stoyo to plant his foot. All right, waiting the snap. It's Peterson. Here it is. Sets it down. Kick is up. It's good. And the Dolphins win the ball game. Yes, the Dolphins sir! Win. 
Keep your parkas on because you're still gonna need them, but before we move on, there are plenty of other games that Frosty would have loved to attend in person, starting with a game in Buffalo that came complete with a touch of Fitz magic. We move on now to those games many players wish it had snowed, because playing in the bitter cold is actually worse. And of course, we have to start in Green Bay, which has seen some of the most iconic cold weather games in league history. Let's start with Packers Raiders from 1993. It was a toasty zero degree day, minus 22 with wind chill, so it made sense that when Green Bay scored on this play, Leroy Butler sought out some warm bodies to celebrate with marking the first occurrence of the now famous Lambeau Leap. And they're going to give it to the Packers. goes to the touchdown. Is that a touchdown or not? It is a touchdown for Leroy Butler. Holy cow. Zero degrees is cold, but no NFL game has ever been played in colder air temperature than the famed Ice Bowl. From Lambeau Field in Green Bay, Wisconsin, it's the National Football League's championship game. Jack. Your thoughts here as we're moments away from the kickoff. I think it's very cold, Ray. The temperature at kickoff for the 1967 NFL championship game between the Cowboys and Packers was negative 13, dropping to negative 15 degrees during the game, negative 48 degrees when you added in wind chill. On the coldest New Year's Eve in the cold, cold history of Green Bay, the Packers met the Dallas Cowboys at the Eastern Conference for the championship of the National Football League. After 55 minutes of play, the Cowboys led by three points, and most of the crowd had almost decided to go home, warm up, and drown their sorrows with a sad New Year's Eve celebration. This was the game that earned Lambeau the nickname the Frozen Tundra. It was so cold, receivers wouldn't even take their hands out of their pockets on run plays. So cold that the new heating system under the turf malfunctioned and so cold, the ref's whistles stuck to their lips. He had to rip it out of his mouth and his lip bled and the blood froze. There was never another whistle in the ice pool. We played the entire ice pool, listening to the commands of the referees saying stop, and everyone did. How do you like that? That's cold. It also happened to end with one of the most iconic plays in NFL history. Packers trying for the go-ahead score. Starr begins the count. Takes the snap. He's got the quarterback sneak and he's in for the touchdown and the Packers are going to be NFL champions for the third straight year. Green Bay has obviously been at the center of plenty of cold playoff games. In 2007, a week after the Snow Globe game, the Giants were in town for the NFC Championship. And all you had to do was look at their head coach, Tom Coughlin's face, to know it was frigid. Heroes of the past and present gathered at Lambeau for another ice bowl. The thermometer reading for that game, minus one degrees, wind chill of negative 23. It was so cold, marching band members had to warm their instruments over a grill to melt the spit to unfreeze the valves. It would have been the perfect type of game for Brett Favre to end his Packers career at Lambeau, except for the result. Favre's last pass for Green Bay, an interception in overtime, that set the Giants up for a field goal that would send them to the Super Bowl. Snap is good. Kick on its way. End over it. Does it have the distance it is? Good! Yeah! Arctic conditions have played a role in plenty of big playoff games, the most famous early on, the sneaker game. Nagurski was all but unstoppable on the icy field as Chicago built a 10-3 halftime lead. The Giants seemed to have little hope but they did have an idea. Ray Flaherty was our assistant coach. He said that one year at Gonzaga, which is where Ray had gone to school, we won a game by using basketball shoes on the field, on a frozen field just like this. He volunteered to go up to Manhattan College and get the basketball shoes for the basketball team. The Bears spent the rest of the afternoon fruitlessly chasing the sneaker-clad Giants. 
They just outsmarted us, I guess. That was about the size of it. It was legal. There was nothing wrong with it. Twelve years later, the Rams played in their final home game in Cleveland against Washington for the 1945 title. I can't say I blame them for moving to L.A. after this game. The Cleveland Rams are cold. The Washington Redskins are cold. And shiver my timbers if the crowd isn't cold. More than 32,000 died in the wool fans, and we do mean wool, braved the frigid wintry blasts of zero weather dressed in everything from earmuffs to such mysterious get-ups as this. Hiya, stranger. Temperature at kickoff was a cool negative eight degrees, making fans take refuge in blankets, stashes of hot coffee, and piles of hay that had been covering the field the night before. Cleveland's ace Bob Waterfield takes to the air, hits Jim Benton on the 12-yard line, and he goes over to give Cleveland an 8-7 lead as the crowd tries to keep from freezing. Then there was that 1993 AFC Divisional matchup in Buffalo, the Bills and Raiders playing in zero degrees, minus 32 degree wind chill. Once again, the game time temperature hovered around zero, conditions which suited the Bills and their fans just fine. Buffalo's defense nailed down the come from behind win. Then 1975 AFC Championship game. Oakland Raiders were in Pittsburgh. It was a balmy 23 degrees out, but negative 10 with wind chill. The temps causing the turf field to freeze over though. The weather had been bitter the whole week in Pittsburgh. It had snowed and they had actually put a big tarp over the field and tented it. The night before it split or something and because it split and it, all this moisture from the uh, heaters they had underneath it had run to the side. And when it split, there was still moisture in the field and it became an ice skating rink. Raiders owner Al Davis even complained after that he believed Pittsburgh intentionally let the field freeze over. He was especially upset because the Steelers won the game in dramatic fashion. Our game was the throwing, the deep ball. So with that ice, we had to move those receivers in and that narrowed the field for us. I'll never forget Pete Rosell said to me, well, it's the same for both sides. I said, damn it, Pete, you don't even understand what you're talking about. It's not the same for both sides. In 1980, it was the Raiders once again having to bundle up, showing up to Cleveland for an AFC championship game with the Browns played in four degree weather. The weather, it is brutal beyond belief. The wind chill factor at this moment here on the lakefront in Cleveland is minus 36. It's treacherous going, but as they say, both teams have to face the same conditions. The Raiders prevailed in this one thanks to Cleveland's kicking game, or lack thereof. While they had two successful field goal attempts, they also missed two, had one blocked, and had another botched by a bad snap. So despite reaching the Raiders' 12-yard line down 14 to 12, the Browns decided to forego another field goal try, which in hindsight might not have been the best call. All season, the Browns lived by the forward pass. In the playoffs, they died by it. Vikings fans know that feeling all too well. They were at home for a wild card game against the Seahawks in 2015. Sort of. They were playing at the University of Minnesota's outdoor stadium. It's Minnesota's first outdoor home playoff game since 1976. On a record-breaking cold day for Minnesota football. The thermometer reading negative 6 with wind chill negative 25. I don't care what nobody say, boy, it's cold. It is cold on the stadium surface. In the sun, it's, uh, it's not even relatively balmy. It was the coldest game in Vikings history, and so bad, their gallahorn shattered before the game started. The end of the game, though, shattered Minnesota's hearts. Down 10-9, to the Vikings were set up for a 27-yard game-winning field goal. Snap good, spot down, Walsh's kick is up. and the Seattle Seahawks are off to Charlotte. Are you me? 
But the king of all cold weather games took place in Cincinnati in 1981, the AFC Championship game between the Chargers and Bengals, appropriately known as the Freezer Bowl. The temperature in greater Cincinnati has dropped to nine below. With winds out of the northwest gusting at 35 miles per hour, we're talking a wind chilled 59 degrees below zero. And the Bengals are playing the San Diego Chargers for the AFC Championship today out by the river. And frankly, folks, you got to be crazy, nuts, to be out there today. You heard it right, negative 59 degrees when you added in wind chill. Even a team of sled dogs would have bowed out of that game. We had a, a very tough head coach in Forrest Gregg that I think had us mentally prepared. He says, men, it's going to be a lot like going to the dentist. You know it's going to hurt, but you got to go anyway. The wind was blowing at a sustained rate of 27 miles an hour. Players saying it felt like 100 steel knives were hitting them. I remember vividly the first uh, play where I had to throw a forearm, and I thought I shattered my arm, you know, because it's just so brittle. Well, getting my helmet on and off was a challenge because it was frozen. It had no pliability anymore, so it was uh, it hurt, hurt a little bit on the ears getting it in, on and off. The Bengals won the game handily. The Chargers not only unaccustomed to playing in conditions like that, but the conditions they played in just one week earlier, the exact opposite. On a hot, muggy day in Miami's Orange Bowl, the Chargers and Dolphins prepared for the first round of the playoffs. The Chargers were in Miami a week earlier, playing in stereotypical Florida heat and humidity in a game now known as the Epic in Miami. No team ever having to make such a huge adjustment from one climate to another in a one-week span. Now, there have been plenty of games played in triple-digit temperatures. In 2001, the Falcons and Cardinals sweated their way through a game in the desert that hit 104 degrees. Well, the stadium living up to its name today, Sun Devil Stadium here in Tempe, Virtue, Arizona. The guys in the truck working already. 100 degrees at kickoff. But you have to head to Texas for the hottest game ever played. The year was 2000, the Eagles were in town, and it was a nice, cool 109 degrees at field level at kickoff. And anyone there will tell you it got hotter than that during the game. Before the game, I pointed out to Troy Aikman that in the middle of the field, the temperature was 175 degrees. He shrugged it off and said, hey, just tell me what the temperature is in the end zone. Throughout the game, Cowboys players were dropping like flies in the intense heat, but for some reason, not as many Philly players. So how did the visiting Eagles not wilt under the Texas sun? Pickle juice. Philly's athletic trainer had all the guys drink it before the game, and it must have worked because the Eagles blew out Dallas 41 to 14. We're here with uh, Coach Andy Reid. Now, your trainers have been getting a lot, giving a lot of the guys uh, pickle juice to prevent cramping and dehydration. Something you believe in? Yeah, well, I do because it works, you know, so we're okay with it. Had any yourself? I, I haven't. I'm not playing, though, DJ. Intense heat may make it miserable to sit and watch a game, but at least you can see it, which wasn't the case for a couple other matchups that were obscured by heavy fog. The game was not an epic battle in the vein of Super Bowl 51, but Mother Nature ensured that it would be memorable. Diving for a touchdown, Patriots! You probably remember that Falcons-Patriots game from 2017, dubbed Fog Bowl 2.0. Television cameras barely able to track the plays, save for the wire cam, which was able to get right up in the action. The fog is so thick, we can't use our upstairs cameras. New England won their Super Bowl rematch handily, even if most of the fans in attendance couldn't see them do it. Gabriel in motion left to right. He takes the jet sweep handoff. He's wrapped up with the five. Taken down by Kyle Van Noy. That game had the 2.0 added to it, of course, because it had to follow in the footsteps of the OG Fog Bowl played in Chicago in 1988. The Eagles could have overcome their own mistakes, yet soon they faced a far greater nemesis, the fog. I've been in stadiums where they put you in high press boxes and you feel like you're looking through the clouds. <laughs> but in this case, we really are in the clouds. The NFC Divisional Playoff game between the Bears and Eagles was played in what can best be described as pea soup. The ref had to announce each play because not even the players on the sideline could tell what was going on. The Eagles and the Bears are playing football, but I can't see nor can anyone else. There are just shadows back there. And he'll throw. Not sure whether it was caught or not. 
Somehow, Randall Cunningham was still able to pass for over 400 yards, throw a short pass and hope the defenders can't find the receiver, right? But Cunningham also couldn't see the Bears defenders all that well. He threw three interceptions, the Bears winning the game 20-12. Here's the snap now to Cunningham on first and ten with no huddle. He fired the left side and it's intercepted, I believe. Intercepted by the Bears and returned downfield. I can't see. I cannot see him. The city of Chicago's M.O. isn't fog, though. It's wind. So before we blow out of here, let's look back at their game against the 49ers in 2005 that included gusts that reached 47 miles an hour. Booting a field goal would be almost impossible as high winds forced Chicago to keep the ball on the ground. I've never seen anything like it in all my years of being around the NFL or playing football back to my Pop Warner days. <laughs> a simple game of catch and the ball is flying away. That, that's Sam's game notes taking <laughs> off. The deep snap, the punt returns, the punters on their drop, it's going to be in effect. You are going to see some things happen today in this game due to the wind that you rarely, if ever, see happen in a football game. There were hot dog wrappers everywhere, hats were flying all over the place, you couldn't tell what the refs were saying half the time, and forget trying to pass the ball or kick it for that matter. Oh, the wind's picking up in a big gust right now too. Big gust. The snap, a tough one, the kick is away. Look at the wind, take that one, Bill. Wow. Watch the kicker, he actually gets blown over right here, watch this. He gets pushed, the wind gust picks up, he has to take a step to steady himself, and then take a look at the kick. Making it a little strange that the Niners would try a long field goal. The swirling winds held San Francisco to one completed pass all afternoon. When the Niners managed to get into field goal range, the wind also helped rewrite the record books. Fasher's gonna retrieve it in the end zone, now he's gonna run it out, thought about taking a knee, he's out to the 10. Vasher spinning away from a tackle, now running right to the 15. And he's got blocking help to the 20. Vasher to the 25, 30. Vasher to the 40. Vasher to midfield. Vasher to the 40. Vasher to the 30 of the Niners. Vasher on his feet to the 15. Oh, yeah, baby. Oh, yeah. Take the Vasher. Coast, coast, to coast. One of the windiest games ever, though, 2008 in Buffalo, Bills Patriots playing in a nice little breeze that almost moved as fast as a car on an open highway. As the wind is blowing straight in his face, 26-yard field goal attempt for Gustowski. The kick is up, the wind drifts it wide to the right. No good. 55 miles an hour. It was so bad the goalposts had to be centered over and over again, including in the middle of the game. No game has ever been blusterier. Yep, that's a word now. But before we go, we have to introduce you to one of the strangest weather phenomena an NFL game has ever been played under. Boy, we done seen five different seasons today. As we all know, 2020 is no stranger to strangeness, but when the Raiders visited Cleveland, even the weather got into the bizarro year that it was. One minute is sunny, one minute is snowing, next minute it's raining, and then the next is hailing the meteorological term for it, as I found out because social media tells me everything, it's grapple. That's right, grapple. A rare mix of sleet and hail or soft hail. Maybe it was the first and last time we see it during an NFL game, but at least the announcers appreciated it while it lasted. You gotta be able to run and throw and make a play in the grapple. You when gotta, it's, when it's you gotta grapple made. with the grapple. It's the rules <laughs> still stay the same, whether it's grappling or not. <laughs> So which game was your favorite bad weather game? Are there any we left out? Did you already know what grapple was? Whatever it's called, it's absolutely affecting everything. Let us know in the comments section below. Look at that thing bend and it cranks off the upright. No good. 